Thanks, Holly. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Martin Pratchett. I'm the Engineering Practice Manager at Engineering New Zealand. And on behalf of the Engineering General Practice Manager, we were, uh, sorry, the Engineering General Practitioners Group would like to introduce uh, Chris from a company called Re Revolutio. He's a structural engineer. He's actually in Portugal at the moment and has, has been on the committee for uh, NZS 1170 Decimal 2 2021. Uh, so we're Pretty happy to have him here to share uh, the relevant updates for New Zealand. He'll be talking about the updates and why they've occurred. Uh, he's put together a slide, um, a series of slides that we will be sharing with you uh, in the near future, not directly after the presentation because um, if there's some really good questions that come through then he'll update the, the slides to it. And so with that I will pass over to you Chris and um, We'll be answering that we'll be doing the q a at the end thank you thanks martin um hello welcome to everybody thank you for, for joining me today this is by far the largest uh demonstration that i've ever had to give so I apologize i'm a bit nervous um to start with it's important to realize that this isn't an exhaustive list of changes there there are some things that i have left out uh and and almost certainly some other things that i've missed the code is long and um and but what i have tried to do is, is pull out the the most relevant things that should be relevant to most people uh where i can give some insight into the why the changes have been made i, I will certainly try to uh but I, I i wasn't i wasn't involved in all aspects so i i i don't always know the answers um if you think i've skipped something uh please add it to the q a and, and we'll try to get to it at the end uh we'll be moving through the slides pretty quickly uh, because watching someone read off slides is very tedious. Um, uh, also, so I can demonstrate how we've managed to automate most of this uh, process for you. Uh, and finally, to maximize question time at the end, because I, I have a feeling there's going to be quite a few. Uh, the presentation will be available to download at the end, so you have it as a reference. So if, if we do skip through things pretty quickly, don't worry. You will get to, to see it again and, and have a copy of it on your computer. Uh, so. Very quickly, uh, a little bit about me. Um, I am a structural engineer, graduated uh, back in 2009 from uh, University of Sydney. Uh, I'm a current committee member on, on the, the AS 1170.2 code, also a committee member on the TR14 code in the US for telecommunication structures. Um, and uh, I was also a contributing author on the, the, the ASI DCTs open sections back in 2016. Revolution was actually founded, funnily enough, in a ferry mead temporary office uh, via fax uh, when I was working EQC back in 2012. It's a little bit of a New Zealand link there for me. I've spent a fair bit of time there and, and uh, we have a few users there as well. Um, in, the, in the last, uh, since 2012, uh, we've, we've fairly steadily built up a user base of 2,800 users, representing approximately 800 different companies uh, in Australia, New Zealand, US, Asia, and the Middle East. So we're just gonna get right into it. As I said, we are gonna go through these fairly quickly. Uh, uh, this is probably less relevant for, for New Zealand uh, engineers, but the, the wind region maps for Australia and New Zealand have um, uh, been updated. Uh, this is uh, the representation of the Australian map. Uh, I'll skip that one as the next one for the one to be relevant for you guys. Uh, wind region maps for New Zealand are only fairly slightly revised, mostly around the North Island up the top there. Uh, and they've got a new name, uh, naming scheme, uh, as you might be aware. Oops, sorry, let me just go back there. Uh, directional multiplier. This uh, particular aspect is caused a fair amount of consternation because uh, particularly for, for poles, uh, pole structures where the uh, MD is being set to, to one for all directions. We've had some clarity uh, from John Holmes, uh, particularly around transmission lines, uh, i.e. transmission lines are very direction sensitive, applying MD from table 3.2 uh, should be fine as long as this is referenced by AS 1170, uh, sorry, AS, uh, NZS 7000. The wind direction multipliers have changed slightly for some directions, but other than that, it's, uh, it's about the same. 
the climate change multiplier, again, this is an Australia only thing for regions B2, C and D. It effectively relates, replaces the FC and FD factors uh, present in the 2011 version, but they're now relevant to, to region B2 rather than just C and D. Um, uh, now, terrain height multiplier, largest emission, uh, oh, sorry, largest removal is uh, TC 1.5. Uh, for open water services subjected to shoaling waves. So you, usually you had to prove, you had to have water over a distance of about 10 kilometers. Trying to prove that can be, can be quite difficult, so it was taken out. Um, so now you've just got TC1, which is effectively water, and TC2, which is effectively land, and you're one of the two. The other interesting uh, change was to the averaging distance. So it's now the maximum of 500 meters or 40 times Z. Uh, instead of 500 meters and 40 times H. Now that distinction is uh, is useful for buildings, well, is, will be different for buildings under 25 meters because you, you, you will use Z equals H for all of the structures and buildings over 25 meters. You, you can just assume, you assume Z. So what you're looking at is the actual MZ cat at a specific height rather than referencing the, the, the height of the, the average height of the structure. Shielding multiplier has been uh, expanded a fair bit to remove some ambiguity, uh, particularly around the maximum slope requirements, the, the point to slope. Um, the other part is that structures exceeding 25 meters in height must adopt this, uh, M, MS of 1.0 for all values of Z. So this is not a thing where you can have a 50 meter high building and say, well, the, the lower 25 meters I can use um, uh, MS of less than one, no. The building is greater than 25 meters, MS must be one, unless you can prove it via wind tunnel testing or other means that, that you actually do have some noticeable shielding. Uh, the, other, the other change is to NS. The previous uh, 2011 version um, uh, referenced HS greater than or equal to Z rather than HS greater than or equal to H. So um, this is now uh, uh, means that MS is uh, effectively the same for all, all values of Z, all heights, uh, uh, upper structure rather than changing with height. Topographic multiplier is, is fairly, is mostly unchanged, uh, minus the change for um, uh, region AO in Australia, which has its own specific equation. Uh, uh, topographic features uh, less than 10 meters in height can now be ignored, which, which is good because um, it helps remove a lot of fluff and, and, and unnecessary uh, MT calcs. Uh, and the final clarification was on the upwind topography features can be ignored. The previous version used to just say 10 times the elevation above sea level and it wasn't clear that was it the site elevation above the sea, le above sea level or the, or the topographic crest above uh, sea level that this is now being confirmed that it's the, uh, the crest elevation above sea level of the topographic feature under consideration and not the site elevation. Uh, Lee zone maps, um, entirely different and uh, considerably more complex now. What you see here, uh, uh, if you go to our website and you, you can find this at the end of the uh, presentation, we've set this all up uh, as a digital map uh, via Google. You can go and you can check it and you can see where these things are. These, um, the ones that are in the code, the coordinates don't exactly match up for all of the, for all of the lead zones. Unfortunately, this is going to be corrected in a, in a amendment or change of some, some description. The polygons as, they, as we have uh, provided by uh, Richard Turner at NIWA and they are the official ones. Um, the, the big change, uh, oops, let me just go back there a little bit. Uh, Aside from the, the shape and the, the numbers is, is uh, the introduction of the lateral zones, um, uh, which is designed to, uh, let's skip along a little bit here, uh, intended to prevent the situation that we previously had where you might have a site uh, here where your, uh, your M lead factor could be point, uh, sorry, 1.35. And then 100 meters away, once you got on the other side of that boundary line, all of a sudden your your M Lee was one, and that didn't make any sense. So now you can you actually, if you're inside the transition zones, you will actually linearly interpolate between um, 
the standard outer and shadow zones and the edge of the transition zones, and then you, you'll do like a double interpolation. Uh, there's, a, there's a full uh, uh, kind of example here that, that you can get from the presentation. Just gonna go back one slide. The Taranaki Lee zone is a little bit different from the rest um, because it's dependent on the relative bearing of the site from Mount Taranaki uh, and the wind direction under consideration. So for example, if you've got a site in the Northeast or, or sorry, or Northeast of Taranaki, um, M Lee will be greater than one uh, for wind directions within a 90 degree sector from the tip. So in this case, wind coming from the South, uh, the Southwest and the West you will consider that Emily will be greater than zero, whereas wind from the north and the east, etc., will be one. Now, if this site was down there, that situation would be reversed. So, if you're if you're in the, the southwest of Taranaki, your Emily for the north, the east, and the northeast would now be uh, uh, above one, uh, and for all other directions, uh, would be one. So that's the change there. Um, aerodynamic shape factor has been revised slightly. First of all, it's been renamed from C fig to C shape. Uh, and we've also introduced uh, the volume factor and that only affects internal pressures. The uh, CPIs are now include KA and KL factors for situations with dominant openings. Uh, although KL still only applies when analyzing cladding, their fixings and members directly supporting the cladding. Um, the volume factor is designed to adjust internal pressure coefficients for building to dominant wall openings based on the internal volume exposed to that opening. So if you have very large volume, the assumption is that your CPI should go down a little bit. If you have a very small volume exposed to that dominant opening, your uh, CPI will go up a little bit. That's, that's basically how it works. But it's also a function of the size of the opening relative to the other openings and the volume being measured, but that's in a nutshell how it works. Uh, the area reduction factor, which previously was only relevant for roofs and sidewalls can now be applied to windward and leeward walls, although the, uh, the factors are a little bit different. Uh, and also only for buildings under 25 meters. Uh, the area co action combination factor, um, internal surfaces are no longer considered effective if CPI, if the absolute value of CPI is less than 0.4. It used to be 0.2 uh, in 2011. Uh, local pressure for cladding, um, value of A for roofs is now based on the, the building ratio H, H on B. It remains uh, unchanged for walls. And uh, the, the, the larger change is the introduction of a new um, uh, reference area, RC2, for downwind corners of roofs with, with a pitch uh, greater than 10%. Uh, and the, the factor is three. Uh, dynamic response factor. Um, there's further clarification on the applicability of section six, the structures with, with unusual characteristics. It, it used to only just be basically points A and B rather than a, a more extensive list of these are the things that, that can't be qualified by the, the analysis that you can get from section six. Uh, there's also kind of a deemed to comply uh, uh, um, criteria for, for certain structures that meet geometric or dynamic parameters in which you can avoid having to worry about calculating C dime as long as those criteria are met. Um, and the uh, interbulence intensity table has been updated for the terrain category one. Uh, from memory, the, the remaining terrain categories um, have not been changed. Also worth pointing out that the, the TC two and a half, that's, it's a direct interpolation between two and three. So these numbers, you actually, if, you're, if you were already interpolating between two and three when you're doing your previous analysis, this does not change it. This number is exactly halfway between those two points. Um, a new dynamic response factor specifically for towers, poles, and masts with head frames, uh, which is designed to better distinguish their behavior from that of a tall building because they do act differently. Uh, this particular section only applies to towers, poles, and masts for which the projected area of head frames and attachments such as lights and antennas exceeds the projected area of the supporting structure uh, and will typically apply to lighting and telecommunication structures 
Note that this is not the effective projected area, it's the actual projected area that is what you are measuring. Um, for other structures where this condition does not apply, such as chimneys and stacks, which do not have uh, attachments to the top or the, or the sides, uh, you still just use the, the previous, the old way, uh, clause 6.4.1. Um, there's also some changes to the cross in response for cantilever chimneys, mast, poles, circular cross section. This entire section has basically been rewritten. So it, it's, it's different from the old one. This is pretty niche stuff that most people probably won't be looking into, but it is worth pointing out that, that this has changed considerably. Uh, and they, they um, even give some, uh, some further information for determining vortex shedding requirements, Reynolds numbers and those kind of things. Uh, Appendix A, multi-span buildings, uh, the CPE factors have been adjusted slightly, particularly the A, the Y, uh, for both sawtooth and pitched roofs. Um, most of the values are about the same, but uh, uh, the, the, the general changes have been adding in a, a second case uh, where there may have previously only been one case. Uh, and the other significant change is the, the introduction of ground mounted solar panels. Uh, which uh, did not exist in the previous version of the, of the standard. Um, and that's the very condensed view on the changes that, that should be relevant to, to what you're doing. What I would like to do now is I'm gonna give you a, a short demonstration of what it is we do um, and how um, uh, the software that we've written is designed to kind of make your life a little bit easier. I get the impression that uh, there's probably a number of you who are already familiar with our software. So I apologize for those of you who do use it, um, that this is, uh, this is covering some ground, but for the new users, I'd like to give a bit of a demonstration. Um, so we'll just open up an existing building. So you can model a, a, a standard building or a pole or a tower uh, such as this, let's go with square. Um, let's stick with the building for now. You can uh, take out wall openings. You can add roof openings. Let's say we've got a window at the top there. And let's say we've got another wall opening on the side here. Let's go four, six meters. And let's do an offset of seven. There. Now I've got in some doors there. The reason for putting in the openings is basically to determine the, uh, automatically to determine the CPIs for the different direction. You can change the, the roof type to a monoslope, uh, monoslope B. You can adjust all of these parameters here. You can even adjust the orientation of the building relative to north. Uh, what you would then do is you would search an address or enter some coordinates or even just click on a map. So let's go somewhere outside of Sydney because I am being pretty Australia centric. Let's go to Christchurch just because I know it pretty well. Let's go somewhere near some water. There we go, that'll work. Let's say we're gonna just build a building here. Drop that in and we will kind of handle everything for you. We will um, determine which wind region you're in. We will determine your terrain categories. We'll determine your shielding parameters. Uh, so we've got T uh, TC3 for most directions with some, with some uh, two and a half and some two. Uh, TC1 where the water is obviously. We've detected all the nearby shielding buildings for you so that you can get your MS calculated. And we've also detected your, well, I picked Crusher, so obviously it's flat. Let's um, maybe try somewhere in, let's just try somewhere at the top of Littleton, make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, so now we've got the MT for 16 different directions. You can then interrogate these various features and find out all the numbers that we're producing. This isn't a black box and it's not really intended to be. Um, and you, this, this works across Australia, New Zealand, uh, South Pacific countries that also use the Australian code, the US, India, to, uh, Canada, soon to be Europe and, and 
Others additional are coming. There are both versions of the code, the new one and the old one, as well as AS4055. We're also working on AS3604, I believe it is, is, is the, the, the New Zealand uh, standard for uh, residential buildings. But you can do comparisons between the old code and the new code. Um, you can go to the analysis tab, and this will give a, an output of, of the, the variation with height for the different wind directions. Um, for the, the various factors. You can have that those values tabulated and you can export that to a spreadsheet if you want to. Uh, internal pressure calculation is automated. Uh, ex, uh, uh, internal and external pressure calculation is automated. Local pressure calculation is also automated. You can do things for cladding or not for cladding. You can update any of these things you want. Uh, and at the end, you can, you can do a, 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 a big text stump report. The other thing that you can do is a little site report here that looks a little something like this when it saves. Uh, just, there we go. So that's a one page kind of summary of, of the things that are, that are relevant for the, the critical directions for, uh, uh, for this particular site. So with that in mind, uh, and the, that little demo out of the way, I am ready to open up to some questions. I'm, I'm guessing, I think um, Martin probably are taking the, the lead on this. Is that correct? You got it. Thanks, Chris. Cool. Um, no worries. Now, there's a fairly specific one from, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to have a stab at pronouncing your name, uh, Dragan. And he said, can mm -hmm. you please explain in the last paragraph on page 71 of uh, a decimal three building with curved roofs for asymmetric loading. So in the general expectation that um, that you don't know that off the top of your head. Uh, I, I, do, I do not know. I do <laughs> not, I'm afraid. I will but, um, just dig that out and... Um, but I can, I can find, I can uh, find out and get, and get back to him though. That's not a problem. That's probably a good idea, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we will put that into uh, maybe into the um, into the slides that come out. So, next one's from uh, Tim Messer, and it says, mm -hmm. "Chris, the code committee is giving out uh, different info for uh, KL Interior. The mm -hmm. interpretation put forward by uh, Johns was that uh, KL Interior will apply to the whole building. However, it's a pass or fail situation. Whom should we put forward questions like this?" to get a code committee direction? That's a good question. That was, <laughs> uh, I can put that, I can put that forward to John. And uh, again, I can find that. I, I know Tim quite well, I'm happy. To, and he already emailed me beforehand about this. I, I'm happy to talk to him about that in a bit more detail and provide a bit more coverage on that uh, and, and email that out to, to anybody who's interested in finding out. But yeah, that's, uh, that's not a problem. Good as gold. And, uh... Next one is uh, with KL now included in the do do a dominant opening CPI value. Does this mean that you need to combine KL effects for CPE and CPI together? Um, give me one second on that one. I need to. I know certain parts of the code back to front, but not all of them. Uh, so just give me one minute on that one. Uh, all right, it's there. I've already got it open. Do you want to uh, another question while you're looking that one up? Yeah, yeah, I okay. think so. Yeah, easy one. Uh, do you know if the commentary is going to be updated? Uh, I don't, but I mean, it needs to be. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I think the the focus at the moment, uh, as I'm aware, is is fixing some of the errors in the in the one that was published because, frankly, it's a little bit embarrassing. Some of the the errors that were not picked up in the editorial process that got released with um, clauses being misnumbered and, and even like missing graphics and things like that. I, I yeah, so I know that that's the that's the primary focus now. Uh, but I feel like I'm going to be answering the, the, these questions in much the same way, which is I don't know at the moment, but I can certainly find these things out and, and let people know. Well, this one you should know the answer to. It is: Can you input your own model to Revolutio? Uh, own model what? 
I'm assuming that, uh, actually, that's a really good question. And I'm not going to, um, I'm not going, I'm yeah. guessing. I'm guessing maybe they're talking about a built, an existing building model. I mean, in the, the, the answer broadly is no, but I mean, model could be anything. Is that, is that a BIM model? Is it, is it a model from an analysis program? What, what would it be? But no, it's, uh, it's designed to be, you, you just put in the, the, the height, the width, the depth and the roof type and, and we will build the rest of it for you. Um, and it's, it's representative of the way the code works, which is basically rectangular boxes with holes in them. Um, yep. And that's as sophisticated as the code gets. So that's as sophisticated as our software needs to get. Can you, uh, can you include can canopies? Uh, in Checkpoint. Yep. Uh, we can. Uh, needs a bit of work, but yeah, we can. Yep, good as gold. Uh, now, ASN ZS 1170.2 Clause 4, 4.4.2 requires consideration of the most adverse cross section within 22.5 degrees of each cardinal direction for calculation of the hill shape multiplier. Does Chequin do mm -hmm. this or just use the cardinal direction section? Indeed, it does. We look at 16 different directions, which is 22 and a half degree offset. So we look at north. North, northeast, northeast, east, northeast, east, etc. I won't go through all sixteen. Nobody needs to hear that. But yes, yeah. uh, and I just to just to give a demonstration, just visually, so people understand what it is that we do. Um, this is how we annotate it, so it makes a bit more sense. So you've got north, uh, uh, and then the north sector, and then you've got north, northeast. So we look at all of these different ones, and then when we're looking at the actual sector. Uh, so when we're saying wind from the east, we look at the worst case from the east, northeast, the east and the east, southeast, and that becomes the worst case one that we use. So everything is still broken down into, into four, sorry, into eight uh, directions, cardinal directions, and then that gets broken down again into four orthographic directions, sorry, four orthogonal directions for the actual building designs when you're doing the pressures and things like that. But yes, it does handle the 22 and a half degree increments, and that's why we we plot out all of the terrain profiles like this for you. Uh, there's also multiple uh, um, DEMs for this kind of thing. So you've actually got a choice on which, uh, you've got some level of choice on the data set that we're using to do the topography analysis. We recommend using the, the New Zealand DEMs that come directly from the New Zealand government, but there is an option in there for maps and the SRTM, which is the, the space shuttle ones from years and years ago, and also Google as well. But you do have to, you do have a little bit of flexibility over over the data that you're using to produce those numbers. Good as gold. Now the next one is um, possibly one that to answer later. But uh, the mm -hmm. changes to hoardings have changed the load factors used for solid balustrades on buildings. This seems to be counter to research done in Australia in the last ten years. Can you please explain the basis of these changes? I cannot. I am afraid. So it'll be one for later. Not, not, yeah, and, and not an aspect that I had. I personally had any involvement with, unfortunately. Good as gold. And uh, next one would be: What wind zone should be used for oceanic islands, specifically, for example, the Chatham Islands? The Chatham Islands. It's in New Zealand. If I'm my if my geography is correct, is is it? Let's find I mean, out. Yeah, so uh, as let's see if this works. We'll find out pretty soon. Uh, where's that? Okay. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know that the code covers that. Normally, the, the code covers islands up to 500, uh, sorry, 50 kilometers from the from the standard coastline uh, um, uh, within whichever zone that it's going to be. Um, and then you've got in the South Pacific, most South Pacific, like Fiji and Vanuatu and Tonga and some of the others, there's a, there's a handbook that's been released that kind of uh, integrates those places into the into the requirements of 1170. It's, it's, it's pretty old now. I think it's like 10 or 15 years old. I don't have a direct answer for this, but again, I can find that out. I, I is this a place where many people live? <laughs> Looks like there's a nice beach there, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I've never even heard go. of it until now. So, yeah, so um, we've got sort of three questions that all link into one. Um, 
and I think that I can answer this myself actually. Does anybody know when NZS 1172.2 decimal 21 is expected to be adopted by the New Zealand Building Code? Um, from what I understand, uh, they you know they run their uh, updates or MB run their updates every 12 months or so, and so it would probably be uh, cited uh, next year, which would be 2022. And then there is typically a 12 month grace period where you could um, where you could use either standard, uh, you know, the older one or the newer one. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. after that, it would um, it would most likely, you know, become the sole method then. And so would you need to reference this as an amendment as a, this as a verif as an alternative solution? Uh, yeah, currently you would. It's not a verification method yet because it's not cited by MB. Um, let me know if I've got any of that wrong, Chris. No, that sounds right to me. That yeah. sounds right to me. Good as gold. Yeah, yeah no, that was. Uh, I, mean, I, I think it, I think it falls a little bit into the engineering judgment category, to, to some degree, as long as the changes aren't hugely significant, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's 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 also my understanding, uh, and the way that things work in Australia too. So, uh, gives people a chance to actually transition across to the new one and, and get to understand it before it's applied. It will just drop from day one. All of a sudden, you have to do everything differently. Uh, uh, as of today. Yep. And, so, and also uh, existing structures that have been designed based on the old one that are in design during the transition period, they will not be required to be say up spec to the new one. If you haven't finished the design and it hasn't started construction yet, you can continue to work off whichever one you started with. Yeah, and uh, engineering is, we, we you know, encourage engineers to use the the best and latest information, which I would assume that, um, you know, we would assume that this new standard is, but if you do, if you are using it, then please be careful on your PS1s uh, to make sure that you don't put that down as a verification method. Um, it's not yet. Now, where we, uh, okay, so that answers a few of those. Okay, so for CPI evaluation, uh, should we assume that potential openings are closed during ULS event, i.e. all the doors and windows are shut because there are high winds? That's the one we used uh, to pick so around just, the office at work, actually. Just having a look, just a bit easy for me to read it. Should we present potential openings are closed during ULS event? Um, I think the intention is that you're supposed to look at, you're supposed to look at both. Uh, you're supposed to consider the what's the worst case because there could be having one opening is is actually the worst um and also and this and this is less relevant for new zealand but in australia in the cyclone regions that it, there's no expectation as, as and, and i may be corrected here uh, so i apologize in advance to the people that i know that work uh towards the cyclone areas who were sitting in on this this uh, uh meeting if i am Incorrect, please let me know. Uh, but there's a, an expectation that usually a door or window will blow in unless it's been specifically made to with, with, uh, withstand it. Um, but I think as long as the, the glazing or the door or, or whatever potential opening is, is, is being deemed to comply to withstand a certain wind level, then yes, you should be able to assume that the, the, the door and the window is closed because usually you will know before a large wind event, you're likely to, to go around closing doors and windows anyway. Um, but my understanding is that an engineer is required to uh, still, if, if there's a chance that something could be left open, uh, um, is required to consider that within the design which can obviously make life very difficult, which, which I understand. And uh, the next one is, and I would assume that it won't happen immediately, but um, what are the implications of the changes upon other standards, uh, e.g. 3604 and uh, AS4055? I am not hugely familiar with 3604, so I can't comment too much to that. I do know that uh, 4055 has already uh, actually came out before uh, 1170 came out so it, it's and there have been some changes to it that's next on our to-do list because we do cover 4055 within check wind we just don't have the new one in there yet the uh, the emphasis is always on um uh, uh 1170 first uh they do a, there's going to be changes because these these 
standards are basically dumbed down versions of 1170 anyway, um, designed to be a bit a bit easier for for lay people to use more so than the, the specific engineering requirements that, that we have to worry about. Uh, but yeah, there, there are implications. I can't, until I go through and review them in detail, I'm afraid I can't give you too much more information about that, but that can also be the topic of another webinar for, for those who are interested. Our, um, and the next question, which is a, quite a pertinent one for some of the work that I do, is are you providing these reports with a PS1 uh, so that they can theoretically done, be done by an architectural draftsman or, or an architect? or a builder, I suppose, uh, or is the intention that the user will be an engineer and issue their own PS1? Are you talking about the site report, a la uh, this kind of document here? Yeah. Do you know what a, okay. a producer uh, statement is? I should have I, asked that first. No, that's okay. I do remember doing a little bit with this when I was living in Christchurch and we were doing some of this stuff. We make no qualifications or guarantees on anything effectively because we can't. It's a piece of software. It still needs to be signed off by an engineer, yep. um, and it and it needs to be checked. So, um, and that's that's about as much as I can say. If it, we, I obviously make every possible effort to make sure that the numbers we're generating make some kind of sense. Um, but the software is not designed to be used as a black box. I have no doubt that I have people who do use it as a black box, but that is not the intention of it. Uh, and, and the reason that we produced this summary report is that you can, it should be fairly obvious to you if, if the algorithm has got something wrong with a terrain category or something, that, that uh, the numbers don't match up. Yeah. Or, so you or, run your or, eye or, over or it does first. make sense? Absolutely. Effectively, yeah, exactly yeah. right. And uh, can you add roofs with different roof slopes in the future, please? Uh, roofs with different roof slopes. Can you alter the pitch and um yes, yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, sorry. I I yeah, let me go back here. You can change the uh, roof slope to whatever you like. Oh, whatever you like. Yep. Okay, good as gone. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the inputs. Um sorry, I've uh I've lost my whoops, crikey. Now the questions and answers have completely disappeared. Give me a tick. There we go. Mm -hmm. And again. Uh, any more clear comments from the new code about how we can evaluate permeability of the building, which will affect the way we calculate internal pressures? No, I was asked about this uh, last week because the code only gives some guidance about this is what we think it's roughly going to be for a concrete building and this is what we think it's going to be for a steel building. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a range between you know, 0.1 and 0.3 or something like that. And, and doesn't really t give you any indication of, well, what if, if is, it, is it still that if it's a big building? Is it still that if it's a small building? Is there a way to calculate that? Um, things like small windows and ventilators and those things, those can fairly easily be calculated. If you've got vents and stuff, you can just look at their area and uh, compared to the area that they're, uh, uh, they're sitting on. But for general leakage, no, I don't, I don't have much. Um, I think there's some stuff in the, the, the wind loading manual from John Holmes that came at the AWES, brought it out. This is 2012 now. I believe there's some guidance uh, in that document. But again, add it, add it to my tally of questions to be answered and I will be more than happy to, to put some of these uh, things forward to the committee to, to get some solid answers. It is gold. And, uh... Let's just have a quick yes and no, because we're running out of time rather than uh, running mm -hmm. through the program. But can you mm -hmm. give a visual output of the wind pressures on each surface on the check wind it's, model? It's on It's on the to-do list. A few people have requested that. Good as gold. Uh, now, good question. How does the shielding multiplier work out the height of the nearby structures? If we have nearby, if we have height building data, which we do in, in usually in major cities, we can get that. Um, through through some of our databases, this, this data is freely available. Um, worth pointing out here. This is a very good question. I'm glad it was asked. Uh, let's, uh, let me just open up a previous one. So this makes a bit more sense. Um, if you're in a if you're in a, a large a large city and this data is available, we will fill that for you. For instance, we've got that here. 
Uh, if it's green, it means that the, the, the numbers kind of come from somewhere or that you've, you've uh, uh, worked them out. So what you can do is if you actually click on the building, let's click on this one, it'll open up street view for you at that point and, and it uh, will allow you to override the, the value that we've set. So let's say that this one's three and a half meters. We put that in, that building is now turned green. If we don't have height, building height data, we, we basically, we, we try and make a conservative guess based on a combination of the terrain category for that, for that, uh, that the building is located in and its, and its footprint area. It's not perfect, but it's, it's the best that we can do, but you can override it and you can manually change it. So it's not, it's not, um, it's not a fixed thing. But if you are planning to use your, your shielding calcs uh, uh, to, to bring your things down, it's something that you need to do a bit of a review on. Um, but yeah, very good question. Ah, and um, for future knowledge and for the person who asked the question before, uh, figure 3.1b shows uh, region NZ4, which includes Chatham and Auckland Islands. Ah, thank you very much, so, Tony. Much now we know. Appreciated. Thank you, Tony. Uh, right, and oh, we are very, we've got about two minutes left in this. Um, okay. So we will. Um, they have okay. So there are no more. Um, oh no, one here. So hi, Chris. Just wondering what the basis of the terrain calculation is for the software. I.e., is it based on the Google Earth terrain profiles, or does Revolutio have its own terrain model database? It's both actually for New Zealand. Uh, our terrain model works better in New Zealand than it does in New Zealand because there's a land cover database because your government is forward thinking and, uh, and consider that these things are useful for a lot of reasons. So we cross-reference both the land cover database as well as Google Earth. Plus we do our own remote sensing um, on the imagery to try and, and, and then we combine all of those together in what we hope is the best possible way. It's not always perfect and I will never make a guarantee that it will be perfect, but I think within the context of New Zealand, we're about 95% right about 95% of the time. The times that we aren't, uh, you can manually, and I'll, I didn't point this out earlier, but you can actually go in and, uh, and change things, add your own zones, delete other zones. Everything within these screens is, is changeable or removable. If you decide that this building is not a shielding building, you can delete it. If you want to draw in a new building, you can, uh, you can also do that. So all of the parts of the program can be adjusted if you don't agree with the, the automated outputs that we, that we provide for you. Awesome. And that's about us time-wise. Uh, what we'll do is, hey, look, thank you for the questions that we've already answered. And um, what we will do is get the questions that haven't been answered yet uh, and send them through to Chris. Send them through to Chris. Uh, and just before we went live on the webinar, I did pose the question to you, Chris, that uh, would you be um, interested in doing like a worked example of... Um, uh, of it if this webinar went reasonably well for you. You seem to have <laughs> gone through it okay. Uh, so early next year, would you be interested in um, in doing like a, uh, a good practice example of a, of a wind speed calculation for somewhere in New Zealand? Yep, that would be fine. Brilliant. And um, look, thank you very much. Certainly appreciate your time. Realize uh, that it's, you know, nearly one o'clock in the morning over in Portugal. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we will... It'll probably be a couple of weeks because we've got to get all of the answers um, updated. And at which point, you know, probably some of the PDFs will be updated and we'll do a QA and a sheet as well um, to send mm -hmm. out to the participants. Uh, so look, thank you for your time. And to everybody online, thank you for yours. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you very much. I, I would like to just say again, thank you to everybody. And my, my email address is part of the... Um, the presentation and the slides that you'll get. If you do have any direct questions and you'd like to ask me, uh, please do. Um, and and I'll, I'll, if I can answer them, I'll be happy happy to. So yeah, thank you very much. And I, I hope you all have a, a great week. Awesome. Cheers, Chris. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye.